comes to us from Luke's Gospel. And I turn to uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 21, in this rather ambiguous homecoming of Jesus. This is on page 61 that I began. Let's continue to listen to the Word of God. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. The truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In our readings today, God inspires the writers to offer us an uncomfortable gospel. It's a gospel that confronts us, really, rather than consoling us. Now you consider the first uh, passage that uh, the passage that I just read here, and that is the one related to Jesus and his uh, relationship to his hometown people, Nazareth. Jesus' hometown people, they've heard his reputation of the great works that he has done in this ministry that he has begun, and, but his great works that he has done elsewhere. Um, but they praise him. Um, they're amazed that one of their own has had this uh, sort of impact on, on other people and on others, other places. He, he assumes, though, and they seem to imply that they expect him to, with ease, do the same thing that he's done there, here at home. But Jesus responds in a very interesting way. What, what he says is, basically, look at the prophets. Look at the, the prophetic pattern. Elijah, he didn't go to any of the widows of Israel. <coughs> Elijah went to a foreigner, saved her, and saved her son from starvation, a widow in Zarephath of Sidon. And then Elijah's successor, Elisha, he didn't cleanse any of the lepers of Israel. Who does he go to? A Gentile. Naaman, the Syrian. With that, the townspeople just turn on him. They literally turn on him, pushing him, as the reading tells us, to the brink of a cliff. Now turn back a few centuries to that, that prophet from which Robin read for us today. He was literally born to be a prophet. I mean, his, his, his destiny was sealed in his mother's womb. And what did that mean? Well, what's interesting is what it meant for ancient Judah, the southern kingdom, was that he was going to disrupt the status quo. Nobody was going to be comfortable with this man's message. We get a little bit of this implied in what we hear today. I mean, uh, we, we, we hear him saying, it sounds like poetry. Well, don't just leave it at poetry. Listen to the substance of it. He basically says that his prophetic role over nations and kingdoms um, according to God, God's call to him was to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, and also to build and to plant. This is tough stuff. 
And we see this, we, we, we see this when we see in the total message of uh, Jeremiah that he's calling for the defeat of Judah by the Babylonians. He's affirming that it's God's will that they go into exile for 60, 70 years. That is God's will for the people, he says to them. And of course, as you could imagine, any sort of message like that is going to get a person into trouble. So what happens? Just go through the book of Jeremiah and find these sort of things. People refuse to listen. Something new and different. People plotted against him. His family betrayed him. He was held captive in stocks. He was publicly ridiculed. His trusted friends turned on him. He served time in the king's prison. He served time in the dungeon. He served time in a guardhouse. He served time in his sister. A sister. So if you think of the prophetic role as being something somehow um, poetic and romantic, read Jeremiah. Get the goods on the reality. These are the consequences of him offering God sometimes really cutting word. Doesn't matter that it's a surgical cut meant to you. It's hard to hear. It's hard to hear when God is having to give us the message that is both loving as well as confrontational. So here are the, the, the two passages we hear today um, are ones that are directly offered to the faith community. Ancient Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah in centuries, five, six centuries before the time of Christ, and then ancient Israel during the time of Jesus of Nazareth. Hearing these hard, hard words. Now, that, that's sort of comforting that they're so far away in history. But uh, they're specifically relevant to us. Really relevant. If you look at the book of 1 uh, Corinthians, uh, we've been preaching from passages there, from there the past few weeks. And um, Robin alluded to the love chapter um, in 1 Corinthians 13. And, and that chapter closes with uh, faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Well, that, that sounds, that's what we want to hear. Um, that great message of faith, hope, of love. But the problem is, is that we don't consent to that often enough, that whole idea of love. So let's turn to that a second. Paul the Apostle offers those words, those words in that love chapter, as a subtle message of admonition. He's come down on the church of Corinth at this point. Port city of Corinth, the trade cities. The people are going through there all the time. Strangers as well as locals. The, the deal is, it was not written as a poem to add to the beauty of a wedding. It's where we hear it most of the time, right? No, rather, it's really a, it's a, an amazing message to a church that didn't seem to know the first thing about love as the key to being a community. A faith community at that. It's nothing about the emotional fuel of romance, that love uh, in 1 Corinthians. So we don't have the word eros in there. That, that word's not even in the New Testament, believe it or not, that Greek word. The fuel of romance, attraction. It's not the comforting seal of friendship and family life. That's, you know, where we get Philadelphia from, Philly. It's not the instinct-driven power of brute physicality. The Greeks have another word for that. No, this love is called agape. This is love that gives of ourself. This is love that sacrifices ourself. This is love that I call the other benefiting love. It's not for our own sakes. It's a decision for the sake of others. It's a love which is a decision to heal and to help. And one, as one of our great spiritual forebears, I believe it was Augustine, put it this way, it's the love with which God loves us. God chose to love us rather than to judge us. Agape love. And so what, God, what does Paul tell us about this? He gives us some really graphic things in that chapter of 1 Corinthians. Examples of what kind of love this is. Now but listen, it's 15. It's got a list. I've got a series here, so just be patient. But, but take, take note of these words. It's ever patient. It's ever kind. It's never envious. It's Never boastful, never arrogant, never rude, never self-centered, never irritable, never resentful, never rejoicing in the wrongdoing. Goodness gracious. But it ever rejoices in 
and the truth. It ever bears all things. It ever hopes all things. It ever endures all things. Beyond faith and hope. This is love which connects us to eternity. It's the greatest of all things. You see, this message, because you had a community. This is called First Church of Corinth. It was doing just the opposite of all these things. And Paul had to say to them that this life changing love he was describing is to be the life blood, the life sustaining breath of the Christian community. And it's directed to every one of us across the centuries. It's directed to the congregation of Glen Haven Presbyterian Church. It's a love that calls us at the time of confession at each worship service to say, how did I fare on the love barometer last week? Some good, some stuff that needs to change. And it's also the thing that asks us, what is my strategy? What's my strategy for offering love in the week to come? It's strategic. I want to just allow the, the winds of life to blow us this way and that. We have a, an anchor, the love of Christ, that calls us to be loving that we can use during the week. I told you before that the word compassion and admonish it comes from the same Greek word. And it really implies the two-edged quality we're talking about here. You see, it involves those actions that, that require heart-to-heart -heart action with one another. God has come for the good of humanity, but that means dealing with what's evil in us. God has offered his healing love for all creation, but that means we've got to confront that which stands against love in ourselves. God loves us, but that means that God's got to be honest with us. Tough stuff. This prophetic stuff is tough. And I found that there are two things that I've been concentrating on in my teaching and my, my present day job. Um, both of them are inspired by books that our men's study group has read. First thing I'm doing is teaching a class of 22 high school students how to have crucial conversations. And do you know what those are? Those are conversations which, which will give the truth to one another, as well as respect the dignity of the person that I'm talking to. They may be people who are difficult to talk, talk with for me, but truth and dignity maintain. If you think that's easy, Observe politics in, of families in action. I can give testimonies to myself, myself on that, extended family politics. Observe the politics of any church in action sometimes. Re repeatedly, it's tough for us as human beings to struggle to prevent um, truth and the dignity of all who are present from being lost. It's a real, real hard trick. So repeatedly, we have to make what, what we're tempted to make what sound thinkers call, call a fool's choice. We, we pursue our understanding of truth so aggressively that we hurt other people in the process. We kill relationships. Or we're so insecure about our relationships that we hedge on the truth. <coughs> when you sacrifice either truth or relationship, you've made the fool's choice. We think secular politics can be brutal. Just look at the elections in the past several years. I found that, that, that politics much more local can sometimes really be painful. And so what better time to teach young people who are on this borderland between adolescence and adulthood about how to have that kind of conversation. When Jesus prayed in his last prayer with the disciples that the church might be one, I think he anticipated the difficulty that his followers would have with his commitment. Hearing each other, giving room for each, one, for each one of us to offer our angle on the truth. Because it isn't truth that we have in our hands as sinful human beings. It's our angle on the truth. So being, being uh, uh, so loving that we offer one another room to offer our perspective, while at the same time, we give this grace to one another, this grace that is this other benefiting the second thing that I'm focused on in teaching is to an online class of 19 college students who are using meditation as a way to cope with the inner storms of life. To help them deal with their inner storms so that they don't become external storms. Jesus withdrew repeatedly. Withdrew from the stuff of ministry to take quiet time alone 
He had to get away from his followers, and he certainly had to get away from the people that were panting to reach out for his love and his healing grace. He needed that time. I have to work daily to prevent my inner struggles from misguiding my outer life. These students I'm teaching, they, they will face perpetual outer storms in their practice as nurses and social workers and teachers. They need tools to quiet their inner worlds before facing the broader world. It was important for Christ to deal with it. How can we live without that? So in closing, I ask you to consider how God must be looking at the predicament of human beings in our world. When God faces the situation of humanity and the state of the cosmos, what an amazing and messy picture God must be looking at. God acts for creation and out of grace, bearing truth, abiding love. God gave no prophets a guarantee that they would persuade any leaders to be more just. Jesus showed that we would be regularly unconvincing. We would try to be, be loving. We try to blaze a path for love. You know? The words of love always cut both ways. They tended to heal. They're going to regularly offend. But the point's not that we're supposed to control the impact of love. We can't. But we know that God loved us with healing love. That love changes us. That love can change the world. So it's simple. Love. Love here. Love there. Love everywhere. Let's pray. These are hard words, oh God, you give us. The rejection of Jesus. The pain that the prophet was to anticipate as they sought to offer a word that the world didn't seem ready to hear, a word to heal, but a word hard to receive. Lord, soften our hearts. May we hear your call. May we follow where you lead us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Vocation means having a sense of call. And so we now turn to the hymn.